think we only need to open up the Oregonian today to be reminded of the important economic force that the Port of Portland represents to the region. The port's pursuit of the Mitsubishi contract to refurbish Alaskan oil tankers, which could bring 80 to 100 million dollars to the local economy, is just one example of the port's magnet for business opportunities. With the Mitsubishi pro prospect in the news today, our program committee can be credited again with a timely topic and speaker. Mike Thorne, Executive Director of the Port of Portland, has planned to address what decisions this community must make in order to enjoy the results of trade. So what do you need from us today to help get this contract, Mike? <laughs> Mike Thorne is about to celebrate his second anniversary as Executive Director of the Port. Prior to that appointment, he had a long and distinguished career as an Oregon State Senator from District 29. As a lawmaker, he chaired the Senate Committees on Agricultural and Natural Resources and Trade and Economic Development. Considered a major legislative influence, he also chaired the powerful Ways and Means Committee from 1985 until he joined the port. Perhaps it's Mike's roots and ranching that keep him down to earth. With a remarkably simple resume for so distinguished an Oregonian, he's given me little background to prepare you. So I'll simply turn over the podium to Mike Thorne. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. It's a pleasure for me to be with you, uh, to say good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here with you, and I want to talk to you about two issues. First of all, I'd like to commend the City Club. As was introduced, I spent uh, nearly 18 years in the Oregon Legislature, and during that period of time, uh, you don't know the impact that you've had on some of the policy decisions that the state has engaged itself in. And I can remember the biannual trek from Salem to Portland when leaders of the legislature would come here and consider it such a pleasure to spend some time with the city clubs. So it's an opportunity for me after all these years to tell you that you do in fact have an influence that extends uh, far beyond just the Portland area and I think that's evidenced by the interest that's here and the interest that continues to be uh, held in the city club of Portland. The other issue I want to talk to you about today, and it will be the essence of the text of the, con, uh, the context of my text, is to offer to you the challenge that we face in a new economic world that is developing before our very eyes. And to also suggest to you that there's an opportunity for us to either participate, or if we don't participate, I'd suggest to you the consequences are quite significant. Recent headlines about NAFTA, APEC, GATT, suggest that there's a dawning of a new era, with the North American Free Trade Agreement being approved this last fall by Congress, the conference in Seattle where APEC nations gathered to talk about the economic future of our combined regions, and finally, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade all promise a new and immense trading opportunities for us. A new world economic order is taking shape before our eyes. We can only guess at this moment what the dimensions and the character will be. But I can assure you of one thing, and that is that the constant in all this will be change. And we know that whatever the global economy will be, this region must stay in the thick of the chase in order to prosper. The new global economy offers the promise of a golden era for the Pacific Northwest and for Oregon in particular, if we play our cards right. We're sitting on the very edge of the most economically dynamic area of the world. The global economy and the balance of the shift of power is shifting in our direction. Nine of the world's 10 fastest growing countries are on the Pacific Rim, and today, 54% of all U.S. trade is with Asia. Last year, the Asian communities in APEC grew by an average of 5.5%, while the balance of the world grew by about 2. China, with an annual growth rate of 13%, is well on its way in becoming an economic superpower, barring some unforeseen mishap. At the rate Asia is growing, Asia will account for a half of the world's economic growth by the end of the century. It'll have a population of a billion people, a combined population that's equal to North America, South America, and Europe in total. 
According to Economic Magazine, and I quote, this giant new market will create some of the biggest business and financial opportunities in history. No wonder, then, the world's corporate giants are tripping over themselves trying to find a position or a place in this new APEC region. Few regions are in a better position to profit from the boom in Asia than the Pacific Northwest. We're literally in the right place at the right time. The issue, it seems to me, is whether or not we have the will, the wit, or ready to make the commitment to take advantage of this opportunity for it is our, it is our future. And that's the question, really, that I want to explore with you today. It's my conviction that the biggest threat to anything is complacency. You either move forward or you fall backwards. And I know you've heard that before, but I suggest it's even more critical today as we look at our future. If we literally assume that our location guarantees success, we're in for a rude shock. Yes, globalization means growing markets and expanding opportunities. But it also means the competition will increase to a whole new level of intensity. Our competitors, I can tell you, are anything but complacent. They're busy up and down the West Coast and across the Pacific Rim building new infrastructure and creating opportunities to meet this expanding market. To the south, for an example, the Port of Long Beach has just received final approval to spend $400 million to purchase 725 acres for marine terminal expansion. When they complete their estimated $5 billion appropriation over the next 10 years, they will literally double their container capacity. Said differently, this port plans in the next 10 years a port that res presently today is one of the largest ports in the United States will literally double in 10 years. To our north, the Port of Seattle plans also to double its capacity with its new American President's Line Terminal. A cost of $250,000 is anticipated to complete that project. And further north, Vancouver, British Columbia, is in the process of building a new container facility with on-dock rail capability and an estimated cost of $160 million. Likewise, many other ports up and down the West Coast and many other communities are making similar investments to try to meet an anticipation of the new marketing opportunities that await us. But building the infrastructure is not just confined to the West Coast. We as a community also need to keep a close eye on what's happening on the other side of the Pacific Rim. Take Kansai for an example. <clears throat> it's the second richest region in Japan after Tokyo, with a gross product greater than Canada's. Kansai has launched a super, a super spectacular drive to match Tokyo's economic clout, an effort that not only will give Tokyo a race, but I would suggest will also test the mantle of all of us around the world. Kansai has underway 800 separate public improvement projects amounting to a staggering $270 billion. The massive development program includes, among other things, an international research and development center, the longest suspension bridge in the world, and a new $14 billion airport, which when completed will be the most expensive ever built in the world. The global economy is no longer a shimmering abstraction off in the distant future. It's real, it's functioning, it's a fact of life that impacts every business, large or small. None of us, I'd suggest, will, will escape the influence. All of us, whether we run a business, we practice law, run a forklift, or sell insurance, need to plan and prepare for its consequences. Our future here in Oregon depends on our willingness, I'd suggest, to do all of the things that are necessary to keep this region in the game, but even more, we need to master the game. Mayor Katz recently has made a good start in moving forward aggressively through her business roundtable to develop a proactive international development strategy, focusing attention on industries as a way to enhance Portland's position and its opportunity in this new global economy. The stakes are very high. Trade built Portland, and trade continues to be the bone and marrow of this community as it does the state of Oregon. 40% of the to total personal income in our state, a fifth of the gross product, 
and one-fifth of all jobs derived directly or indirectly from trade. Oregon's rich natural resource base and small population dictate its dependency on trade, and I believe this dependency will increase as the state looks for ways to generate more revenue to offset budget shortfalls that trouble all of us. We've already seen one example right here in this community of what a robust economy can do. When the city of Portland realized an unexpected $13 million in revenue, the economic prosperity offered by expanding our trade provides this state, I'd suggest, the greatest offset to the potential negative impacts awaiting us under ballot measure five. Portland, by the good fortune of our geography, has always been a crossroads city. It's been a transportation hub. Today, our geography gives us an even better advantage or greater advantage than it did in the past. I'd suggest it's our future. Not only do we have a strong, proven trading relationship with the world's fastest growing communities in Asia, but we are equidistant in position from Europe which gives us an ever greater opportunity to expand the trade relationships between Asia on the one hand and Europe on the other. I'd like to give you a list of some of the attributes that many of us don't realize we have in this community. We've established a position as one of the West Coast's largest distribution centers. We have an airport unlike any on the West Coast that has room to expand. We now have better air links to the Asian countries that I've talked about earlier than Seattle with Delta's nonstop service. 31 passenger all freight carriers serve Portland, three transcontinental railroads cross, and 20 ocean-going shipping lines serve our community. In addition to that, there's 150 trucking companies that have regional hubs in our community. And last, and maybe most significantly, we have two rivers that cross in our backyard and two interstates that intersect in our front. Who can match our potential? Not many. But it's us to, up to us, I'd suggest, to build on what we have. <clears throat> Recently, World Magazine named Portland as one of America's top ten international cities to do business. This international publication claimed two things. The position we're in relative to the expanding trading world where 400 high-tech companies have come to locate in our community and a port, and I quote, that rules as a West Coast leader in total export cargo. It also gave Portland high marks in other areas. We were second for international presence. We're fourth for air transportation, second for educational attainment, and given credit for fourth in the list for cultural diversity. So when you add this all up and you look at where we are, I think the first question that would come to mind, so what's the point? In other words, how can we miss? Many may ask. We have more going for us than most. The same potential could have been said possibly for Port Towns in Washington back some 100 years ago. Older by six months than Seattle, it was becoming the New York of the West. A subsidiary of the Union Pacific Railroad proposed to link up the town with cross-country lines running to Portland. On the strength of the prospect, Port Townsend took off. New settlers poured in. A phone company was uh, established. Six new banks opened their doors. Sawmills were constructed, and the town's population literally swelled. Then. The company laying the tracks went belly up in the panic of 1893. The town virtually died. The hammers of economic growth stopped. With today's economic landscape changing as fast as it is, modern versions of Port Townsend are not impossible. We too, my friends, could miss, and in some cases miss badly, if we fail to maintain the quality of our workforce if we skimp on the tools necessary to maintain the highly competitive status of the businesses located in our community, and if we degrade the urban and natural surroundings here that represent one of our biggest drawing cards. We could miss and miss badly if we let our education system deteriorate. Barred by Washington Governor Mike Lowry's comments recently, 
when he was boasting about the contribution his state was making to higher education, I'd like, I'd like to quote for you what he said. He said, compare that to our friends to the South. In Oregon, he said, education systems are being decimated because of the myopic Proposition 5 tax rollback, which will be one of the worst things that ever happened in a state. He said, there's no way you can compete globally and wipe out your education system. Those are harsh words, but if Measure 5, or if we let Measure 5, or the, the effects of it decimate our education system, his prophecy could well be true and our future could be in jeopardy. I'd suggest we also could miss, if we allow the very thing that makes us unique here, and that's our livability, to be choked by unmanaged growth, growth that swamps urban boundaries, turns Portland into a sprawling, congested, polluted Los Angeles or Seattle. <laughs> we, we, could, we could miss <clears throat> if we did not find the common ground on critical environmental issues that affect transportation. For an example, we have to deal with the depletion of the salmon population in a manner to preserve our environmental heritage and to protect the runs before it's too late. But I'd suggest we can't do it at the expense of the Columbia Snake River waterway that today moves 10 million tons of cargo to world markets. We could miss if we don't take steps to accommodate the larger modern ships that are being uh, developed today and will be coming into service and will dominate the trade in the early part of the next century. To do this, we need to deepen the Columbia River Channel from Portland to the sea. The task of digging the channel is quite simple. However, relieving concerns in certain quarters is not. Again, we need to find the common ground of understanding that the project we are proposing is necessary and can be done in a fashion that is, comp that is complement to our environment. We can miss if we do not take the wise decisions or make the wise decisions relative to the streets and the highways in our community. It's vital that we make a sound, balanced decision to speed the movement of people and goods within our region. Light rail is only a part of the answer, I'd suggest. Let's not overlook the need for fast, efficient movement of freight. Trucks need to get to ships and trucks need to get to planes on their way to the market, wherever that market may be. Recently, as we were meeting with a group, and I want to cite an example that makes quite vivid the interplay and the interplay that's critical in making sure that our transportation system works efficiently and effectively. One barge load of grain, for an example, that may not come down the Columbia River because of interruptions in that system, mean 115 trucks have to come to Portland to accomplish the same market access. The impact that has on our community would be significant. <clears throat> we could miss if the port does not invest its limited resources wisely in facilities that enhance our transportation connections to world markets. In the next decade or two, the port will need to invest some $700 million in facilities. That's your port. About a third of that will be needed for improvements on the waterfront. Today, we're moving forward with a $20 million crane improvement program, and we have plans to spend another $25 million in Rivergate to make rail and bridge improvements. Later on, we will need to spend about $100 million to purchase the west portion of Hadeland Island to build a 500-acre marine facility that will accommodate market access in the year 2010. The rest will be used at our airport. The new concourse for United is now complete, and many of you enjoy it. Our node, as we call it, the lobby expansion is now complete. And later this year, we hope the new, and I'd call it stunning, Concourse D will be in place to match the quality of our international terminal. Then we'll turn our attention to the south side of the airport and what will be a never-ending challenge to meet the demands of passenger growth. Two years ago, we grew at 14%. Last year, we grew at 18%. That's a growth rate, my friends, that are 15 to 18 percent faster than any other or any national average that you'd look at. 
and you could simply say that PDX is the fastest growing airport on the West Coast. When it comes to airlinks, then, we're in pretty good shape with our access to the Pacific Rim. Our major underserved market is a challenge that this community has uh, met without success for several years, and that's what do we do about Europe. In addition to passenger inconvenience, for me, it's simply not acceptable that 85% of the Europe-bound cargo leaves here by truck. To maintain economic stability for this community, we've got to get that service. And I'd suggest the same could be said for the new developing markets in Mexico. Businesses here that plan to prosper as a result of the opportunities there will fail miserably if we don't provide the transportation link that allows the product that we produce to get to those markets. But all this effort to build facilities and provide transportation links will fail if this community doesn't use the service that it has. We're fortunate with nonstop service to Asia Recently, the port was successful in nonstop service to, to, to New York. But if this community doesn't use it in today's market dynamics, it will lose it. And that's something all of us need to assist in. And last, we could miss and miss badly if we do not restore the mutual trust between taxpayers on the one hand and businesses and government on the other. The sense of trust that once was an Oregon trademark is badly frayed and urgently needs repair. And all of us in this room need to work on that. You know, as I look ahead, I also can look back, and I'm encouraged by what I've seen this community do. More than 100 years ago, when the access to the sea, the ships that were coming to Portland to take the new products then to market, suddenly was threatened because the river was starting to fill in, this, this community stepped forward and created the Port of Portland and did, in fact, make a channel to the sea. Back in the 50s and the 60s, when an increasingly ramshackled central business district threatened to turn Portland into another urban casualty, this community mobilized its efforts and reclaimed its waterfront. And when traffic congestion and air pollution began to intrude, on the livability of this region, we mobilized again and began building with federal tax dollars and local tax dollars and a commitment from this community, a mass transit system that today is considered a model. And today, under the leadership of Tom Walsh, TriMet is moving to address the transit needs of tomorrow. I guess finally what it all comes down to is this. Without a strong, stable business climate, that builds a solid economic base that is encouraged to move us forward, to respond to the needs of Oregonians, to provide the jobs, to pay the taxes, that support our community and build needed in infrastructure, we will have failed. But on the other hand, if we do respond, <clears throat> the hammers won't stop here like they did in Port Townsend. The opportunity is one that simply, or the obstacle standing between where we are today and the potential of tomorrow is us. We are the ones who can set the priorities. We are ones who can choose the proper allocation of public dollars. And we're the ones who should know that the future is taking the system we have and making it work better. This is not a question, it seems to me, of how do we necessarily just create new tax structures and raise more taxes for something we don't have a clear definition of. But in fact, we know, as successful Oregonians, that if we maximize the output of the system we have today, we will in fact meet the challenge of tomorrow. It's great. We can certainly see the potential reward. The question is, are we ready to go to work to make it happen? And I'd suggest we don't have much time to waste. Thank you very much. Questions first from Andrew Wheeler, and then Ken Hill, and then other City Club members. Before lunch, I asked uh, one of my old high school pals, Dick Montgomery, uh, why Mike didn't run for governor. And Dick said, 
you know, for someone who's been working for the port for a long time, I'm awfully glad he didn't. And I assume that we're in, then in good hands. Uh, Mr. Thorne, are we in a game where the big teams north and south of us win, or does our freshwater port with the railhead closer to the heartland have some real advantages that, if we master the game, will cause Pacific Rim traders to choose our port. What are those peculiar advantages, given our physical location? I have to assume by the softball that Nick Dick also wrote the question for you. <laughs> <clears throat> It never ceases to amaze me that in this community we always think north and south, and that our greatest geographic and physical attributes runs east and west. We've got a Columbia River system, we've got three railroads, and an interstate highway system. We have literally the geographic advantages and the natural resource that puts us in a position to in fact be the major port in the Pacific Northwest. It's beyond me to understand why a trainload of cargo goes by our dock on its way to Seattle when it can literally unload the same cargo in Portland and be on its way to Tokyo hours faster. So the Columbia River system, the attributes I've laid out, is really the strength of this community. Finally, to respond most clearly to the question, I had someone, and I'll keep the name anonymous, that told me had Portland done 30 years ago what it should have done, there would never have been a port of Tacoma. <clears throat> Mr. Thorne, you mentioned the figure $700 million mm -hmm. for improvements to the uh, air and uh, marine, marine term terminals. Excuse me. Uh, where will you look uh, for the source of that money? What do you see as a way to finance <clears throat> that? Work backwards, the largest amount first. As I mentioned, about a third of it will be non-aviation related, the balance that obviously is rela related to the aviation side of our business. <clears throat> We're very fortunate in this community that we've developed almost a love affair with our airport. And, <clears throat> and the airlines that serve us understand that support. So they're encouraged to continue to maintain strong support here. And as long as we use that market, the carriers will come. So we're very fortunate by the fact that to date, all of the expenditures, and I'm sure that'll be the case in the future, that go into fill, building that facility <clears throat> come from our ability then to market revenue bonds, which are provided for by the carrier's service. It's not a general tax on the public, but rather we sell revenue bonds that is, that is a function of the strength of the carriers that we have, and that's the way we plan to finance those future expansions at the airport. The marine terminals, the things that we're doing today, we're attempting to uh, finance those out of accrued earnings. But I'd suggest to you that a project like Hayden Island, a $100 million project out in the future, is something that we may want to talk to the community about in terms, is this something that we need to make a joint investment in? So I'm telling you today, we, our plans in the short term are to finance everything from a well-run port organization, I hope, in the future, there may be some major capital improvements that we feel collectively that need to be made that could well require uh, voter consideration. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thorne, I'm Greg Kafuri. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask about one particular kind of cargo, one which is all risk and no money, and one which uh, feeds an industry that the world might well be better without. The uh, longshoremen in Seattle have agreed not to uh, load radioactive cargo, and the Port of Seattle has backed them up on it. In Portland, the longshoremen have said that they will refuse to load radioactive cargo, and I'm wondering whether the Port of Portland will uh, insist that uh, we take the risk that Saddle, Seattle has refused to take. Everyone understand the question, I'm sure. <clears throat> All ports up and down the West Coast, including the Port of Portland, does not want to handle that cargo. We've taken the same position. Our tariff is very clear. That's a cargo that we don't want to handle. The question really is, is the federal government going to force a community or a port on the West Coast to take it? I can't answer that question for you, but I can assure you that that's a cargo that the port doesn't want. It's a cargo that the longshoremen have concerns about, and I'd suggest to you in defense of their position that really 
we have a very productive workforce. It's one that uh, knows their business. And I think the concerns that they have about other factors relative to the fact that the cargo moving may well be the larger safety issue that they're talking about. I wouldn't want anyone to think that that workforce couldn't lift it and load it and do what they have to if they're required. So the Port of Portland has assumed the same posture that all other ports on the West Coast have, and now the question is where does the federal government force that cargo to move? Uh, Fred Can, member, you mentioned the need to increase the trust between government and yes. the people. Uh, from your 20 years in government service, do you have any suggestions for the gubernatorial candidates for next year's as ways to improve that uh, level of trust from the government from the government perspective? Well, I would hope that, and I'll answer the question, but I would hope that it doesn't be put into the category that I'm trying to compete with them because I, I got my hands full where I am. <clears throat> You know, it really gets down to setting the priorities that I referred to. Uh, Oregon is going through a transition. The voters have said, we're not satisfied with the way our tax system is functioning, and we want to change that. <clears throat> and really, it seems to me then that leaders should understand that it isn't as though people are against doing things, that they want to turn the community backwards. But really, I think it's a matter of understanding that when you have a challenge, you have to understand what's most important, and you address that first. I believe, if I were to give any suggestion to anyone that we're running for office and bless them all, the first thing they need to do is figure out what's most important. We can't be all things to all people. And we as a community have got to come to the conclusion that although maybe our interest is important to us, it's got to be factored in the total. And once we come to the grips of understanding the relationship between our special interests and the greater public good, such as educating public safety and taking care of those people who can't take care of themselves, then we'll move forward to set priorities and start to gain public trust. And finally, I'd say I think you gotta, we got to quit the game of moving the goalposts. And we need to establish some credibility and stability in the system that government delivers. Uh, speaking of the airport, you said if we don't use the airport, if we don't use the air links that are being established, we'll lose them. What can the port do or what is the port doing to encourage people to, to use the airport? <clears throat> well, clearly the port works with the local organizations, be it POVA, the State Tourism Division, in an attempt to try to build, as well as business communities, the awareness for the service that's there and to try to promote it. I said that because I want us all to understand that the world of transportation has changed. It used to be that you could get on an airplane here and knew that their course or the route was regulated and you just paid so much along the way. Today with the $59 fares, uh, uh, the system is a completely different one. It's market driven in total. And so if we don't provide the market base as a community that allow carriers to come here and be successful financially, they'll do what they did in San Jose, where Americans simply left. So the port is doing what it can from a market development side, but it really is a market function. And this community has got to decide whether it wants to use that system or lose it. I'm pleased to say, because we're the most rapidly growing airport on the West Coast, today the results look good. But the challenges in the future are even more demanding and will require a greater commitment from this community. Uh, Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Thorne, uh, you mentioned a growth of 15% last year and 18% uh, mm -hmm. this year last, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, at the Portland International mm -hmm. Airport. Uh, you uh, probably a couple of years ago completed a new parking structure in front of the uh, terminal. Mm -hmm. Uh, how are you planning to accommodate future growth, or more specifically, when will the port spearhead extension of the light rail to the airport, now that it moves also to the west? I was disappointed if you didn't ask the question. <laughs> the port is a very active participant through the JPAC organization. That's a metropolitan planning organization that has to make the decisions about the allocation of various uh, transportation-related dollars and projects in our community. 
and as a part of that as a part of that organization, we're an active participant in making those decisions and working with the community to try to understand where best to apply public dollars to provide access, be it at the airport, be it the, no the west extension or the north, the north-south uh, route. As it stands today, uh, it, the planners tell me that it looks like, given the need to complete the west extension and the need to, uh, to plan for the north-south link, that sometime after the year 2000, the question of light rail at the airport is one that we would be moving forward on. I want, to, I, want to, I want to make it clear, as I respond to the other question, we are in a situation at the airport where we're looking to the carriers to help finance the growth and the expansion. <clears throat> and I would suggest that we need to continue to build that market base so that we can encourage the carriers, if it's possible, to look favorably on those projects when we get to that point in time. So our plans are to work with the community to maximize the allocation and the application of transportation dollars. And we have reserved the right of way uh, as we plan for the future so that, in fact, the rail can get to the airport. But today, the priorities of this community are to take care of the west side and deal with the north-south first. And then at some point in the future, hopefully, uh, we'll be in a position to talk about the airport. I thought you said earlier we don't have much time to wait. Well, uh, that's a good admonishment for all of us and this community. I'm Don Sterling, Mr. Thorne, a member of the City Club. Mm -hmm. Recently, Marshall Glickman, the Vice President of the Trailblazers, said publicly that he had reason to think that the Louis Dreyfus grain elevator at the east end of the steel bridge might be available for redevelopment. Is that anything that the port has paid attention to or that is concerning the port for the potential loss of that terminal? Actually, the Dreyfus facility is owned by the Dreyfus family, and many of you may have noted that recently uh, Archer Daniel Midland purchased all of their facilities except the one in Portland. Uh, the, the port has no direct interest in the operation of uh, the Louis Dreyfus facility. However, obviously we have an interest in what happens as far as uh, cargo movement on the river. But our facilities are generally on further downriver, and uh, quite candidly, I suspect that, that looking at where that facility is today and looking at the capacity that's available, we could continue to accommodate the fact that Portland is, by the way, the harbor, the largest wheat exporting port in the U.S. with the facilities that are presently available at other outlets on the river. So I don't think that's of any major concern to us. I'm Gus Matterstorff, member of the club. Mm -hmm. uh, you've addressed your remarks so far entirely to Oregonians, particularly mm -hmm. the population of the Tri-County area. Uh, the residents of Clark County derive substantial benefits, I think, from the existence of the port. What would you have to say to them, uh, both with respect to fiscal affairs and with respect to other affairs? Good question. Actually, uh, when I talk about the Portland area, I include the Clark County area as a part of our area. We work closely with the ports across the river. Seven ports on the Columbia River, including four in Washington today, are working on this channel deepening project that I talked to you about. Uh, we work very closely with them. Many of the passengers that use the airport come from as far away as Olympia. They consider Portland basically their airport. And as time passes, I think that will continue. I think this community really needs to understand what it can do to try to bridge the gap that uh, exists between two states where tax structures are different and sometimes that's used to the advantage of one or the other and try to plan for the future in a way in which we can maximize the potential that this larger metropolitan area uh, possesses. So I can only say that they're a part of the community and we need to understand that and there's a lot of synergy that we can build off of. The port recently, uh, jointly with the Port of Vancouver, for an example, approved a, f a project to put in a joint auto dock. And I would imagine that in the next few years, you'll hear more announcements where the two communities are working together to function basically as one. Steve Shell, member. Um, you mentioned uh, concern for deepening the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the channel is about 39 feet now, or at least that's what it's supposed to be maintained at. There's a great controversy, um, as, as you well know, between wetlands, preservation, 
and disposing of dredge spoil when it comes out of the channel. Mm -hmm. If you had to deepen the Columbia, what, what would the depth be? How much more do you have to take it down under the bar? And where are you going to put the stuff? <clears throat> the channel presently is at 40 feet. The need of the vessels that are calling in the future would dictate the need for a 43-foot channel. As you pointed out accurately, Steve, the concern is not taking the channel deeper. We're not, and, and fortunately, to go the three foot deeper than where we are basically is moving sand and gravel. We're not having to do blasting and get into bedrock. The concern is, what do you do with the product? What do you do with the product that comes out of there? But to give you some, some measure of the magnitude, we're looking at probably 20, I guess 20 to 24 million cubic yards of material that would be required to deepen the channel. The channel presently is in excess of 43 feet in most of the areas going down. So these are isolated areas along the way. To give you an idea of what that represents, uh, many of you probably followed a year ago that a steel subsidiary or a steel company, Nucor, was looking at St. Helens. In order to build the, the site, which people basically embraced in this uh, community, and the governor I know was very supportive, would require 8 million cubic yards. That's almost a third of what we're talking about to, to deepen the channel. I realize that the concern relative to the deepening project is not the project itself, but where do you put the materials as you accurately describe. Part of our project on Hayden Island would involve conceivably a place to put that material. The Port of Vancouver has an interest in the material, St. Helens and other communities. So I think the challenge for us really is, and that's what the feasibility study that we're working toward is all about, is to try to help us identify those areas where we can safely deposit the material, put it to beneficial use, and not interfere with the wetlands and the other activities that are so critical up and down the river system. To date, we've not gotten to the point where we can start talking about the feasibility study. However, I'm very hopeful that later this year we'll be on with that project, which will take us a couple of years. At the end of that time, then I can better answer your question. I'd say one other final thing on the channel. We worry about the fishery, and I referred to it in my comments. Recent, recently, NIMPS, the Northwest Marine Fisheries, uh, uh, told us that maintaining the channel today at the 40-foot level has no impact on the salmon runs, that the fishery is generally in that 20 to zero, from 20 on up. So maintaining the channel as it relates to the fishery is not an issue. The issue is, where do we put the material? And I can only tell you that that will be scoped in the feasibility study and hopefully working with this community and others down the river will find the right places to, uh, to accommodate that deposit. Perhaps while I watch for other people to come up to the question, I might have my own question, which is, uh, do you care to comment a little bit more on the prospect of this Mitsubishi contract, and particularly from the standpoint of how the port operates to help in contracting opportunities like this? Uh, help us see what your role is in some of these mega deals um, that kind of have a ripple effect. Well, I think the, the article in the newspaper was pretty accurate. Uh, uh, one of the challenges in trying to put something like this together, realizing the port is responsible for running the shipyard, if you recall, this community stepped forward and approved a bonding measure that allowed <clears throat> the port in the late 70s to, to acquire the dry dock, and that really is a magnet that draws substantial business to this community. So the port looks at that uh, operation, if you will, not dissimilar to how any other business entity would, entity would look at an operation. We've got to make sure that it can sustain itself. As you recall, the port made a decision shortly after those bonds were approved to take them off of the tax rolls, and we were trying to pay for those out of revenue that we generate from the activity there. So there's an enormous amount of pressure on us to function just like a private sector company would to make sure that that, that operation is successful. We're having to respond to world markets and world dynamics, and in the last five to ten years, basically the U.S. ship industry, the ship uh, building industry has essentially deteriorated to the point that what's left is essentially a few large companies scattered around the world. So we're looking at our situation where revenues this year and when we report uh, our results, I'm not going to be proud of them. We're going to have to show some losses at the yard. It's because the market hasn't been there. So we've concluded that if we're going to continue the trust with this community and manage that appropriately, 
we've got to go where the action is, if you will, get the contractors here that can bring the work that can make that yard a financial success and provide the jobs and do the things that the public had hoped would happen. As a result of that, then, we have felt that we needed to move out beyond our local uh, area in an attempt to try to bring in and attract to this yard, the magnet being the dry dock, contractors who can work here and accomplish the objective. As the article stated, this is in an exploratory process. I can only tell you that, uh, that uh, we're as anxious as anyone else is that this is successful and fulfills uh, the objectives of the community. And I'm sure we'll have an opportunity in the very near term. This is moving faster, I guess, than what I had thought it might. We'll have an opportunity to talk with various people in the community where help can be offered. Clearly, as the article accurately described, a positive, productive attitude on the part of the workforce is critical, and I think you could observe that that exists. We have a very good workforce uh, here in doing that kind of work. So the weeks ahead will tell a story. Right now, uh, I'm as anxious as everyone else is as to the end result of that. One more question from the board house, I guess. Um, you said uh, Portland is the West Coast leader in total export cargo uh, to Seattle and Vancouver and Los Angeles. Agree with that statement? Uh, and the other thing I would ask, I guess, is what uh, port leads and imports and why? They don't have to like it or agree with that's what the numbers show. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, when I make that statement, uh, this, this community uh, has long been the gateway to the world market. I told you earlier that the, the Portland Harbor is the largest wheat exporting harbor or, harbor or port in the United States. Uh, we are known for basically our export cargo, wood products, primarily lumber. We export very few logs. Uh, grain is a large export from our area. And that's in part enhanced by the fact that there's a lot of grain that comes here from the Midwest. There are unit trains that are leaving uh, the, the, the Dakotas and, and Nebraska bringing corn into our area. So we get credit for that kind of export volume. Portland is, and this is one of the things that our competitors don't want to really admit, Portland is, is faster by sea to Japan than our competitors to the north. And we think this river is an encumbrance. In fact, it's an asset. It allows us to bring down to the end of the funnel, if you will, high-value cargo that can then speed its way to the world markets. As far as imports, uh, we're not a large import center. But over time, I think Portland will continue to develop uh, consistent with market demand, the opportunity to address import markets. Autos are what we're really known for as far as the import side. And presently, uh, to give you an idea of what good infrastructure does for your, for your economic base, Hyundai serves 44 states out of Portland with their auto import facility. They discontinued service on the East Coast and basically feed all of their autos in through either the Los Angeles area or Portland. And that's simply because of our superior rail connections to the East Coast and to countries beyond. So basically, we're a, we're a natural resource-based, historically exporting port. We're growing in import cargo, and we'll continue to grow a lot of import container volume. The high-value agricultural products that rest at the upper end of the Columbia River system are really premier products uh, in an expanding Asian market. We have a bright future. Well, just as Charlie Hales gave us a vision of the East Bank of the Willamette, um, Mike Thorne has given us a vision of our Pacific Rim opportunities and Portland as a launching point. And we, I know you'll join me in thanking him for his work and for his talk today. We're adjourned. <laughs>